Western Union Mission Week talk. Uh, can a good God really allow suffering? A pretty good question. Um, and so to answer this great question, we have a great guy, Phil. Um, unfortunately, this uh, tiny walker can't be here today. But we have Phil, who works at Euston Church. He studied languages at Durham, and he's from Northern Ireland, and he's all around Diamond Giza. So, um, yeah, I hope you enjoy his talk. Um, one thing I would say is that you may notice uh, phone numbers dotted around the room. Um, Phil's going to talk for about 20 minutes, and... Um, then we're going to have a question and answer session where a panel will come up and we can ask questions and discuss them. And I personally know that when I've been to these things in the past, that has been such a wonderful time to, um, yeah, to get things off my chest or to, like, if I don't agree with something that speaker said, I think it's good to question things. I think we believe we have a faith that stands up to criticism. And I know that my faith has been strengthened by questioning things and grappling with big issues. So if you have a criticism, if you don't agree with something Phil said, if you think it's wrong, text us in and fire away. So without further ado, can we give a very warm UCL welcome to the wonderful film? No, Paul. No. Um, I would say again, do, um, as I speak, um, back up what's just been said, do scribble down questions, we'll have a panel at the end, um, and we'd love to try and in, in, uh, engage with what's being said. Can a good God really allow suffering? Um, why doesn't Jesus stop the suffering? I don't know if this name means anything to you, Nevin Spence. Uh, he was a chap, um, an Ulster rugby player, uh, 22 year old, a real talent, a uh, future Irish international. Um, lovely guy, his family were farmers, honest types. What they've got on farms is what they call slurry tanks. Now a slurry tank is, is where they put all the manure and the, and the fertilizer, um, a big, big tank full of all of that. And because of all of the, the chemicals that get produced, uh, the methane, the hydrogen sulfide, it's actually a very, very dangerous thing. A year ago, um, it was just a normal Saturday on the farm, um, the family dog had got into the slurry tank. Uh, panic uh, was, was everywhere in the family. The dad, Noel, didn't know what to do. He went into the tank after the dog, but very quickly was overcome uh, with fumes. And the eldest son, Graham, he was a 30-year-old father of two, and he followed his dad in to try and rescue his dad. He, too, was overcome by the fumes. Finally, Nevin uh, went in after both of them tried to rescue them, but again was overcome with fumes. The fire brigade was called, but they were too late, and all three of them died. Mum and sister, Graham's wife and two lovely kids left to contemplate this mess, this tragedy, ripped apart. Or I think of a friend of my parents, a lovely lady um, named Sharon. Uh, she was a nurse, she was married with a little girl. Um, at the end of her nurse's training, uh, she started developing symptoms that she herself was able to diagnose as multiple sclerosis. And at just the time whenever she needed him most, her, 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 her husband walked out on her. And for 30 years, her condition deteriorated. Her last 10, 15 years, she wasn't even able to speak. Now those are sad, sad stories. But the, the, the sad thing is that these stories aren't unique. If we went around today, we're not going to do it, but if, if we went around today with the microphone, I'm sure there would be countless examples of people that you knew, know who have suffered like this. And I guess in a room this size, there are people who have suffered in ways like this which I can't even imagine. And so our question today is very, very important. Can a good God really allow suffering? Or, Jesus, if you really are powerful, why don't you stop it? Well, I want to say that um, up front, that whilst the Bible gives us something of an answer to this question, it doesn't give us everything. And I want to say also that um, whilst in this talk I want to point us to what the Bible says, um, I'm not going to say everything of what the Bible says. There'll be a chance afterwards on this panel to ask some more. But I want to explore some different um, possibilities. First possibility, maybe it's that Jesus doesn't care enough. 
Maybe he is able and powerful, but he's just not bothered by it. First possibility. I'd like you to, um, if you'll see in your seats, these copies of John's Gospel. Can you pick one of these up? And turn to page 28. Um, John's Gospel, it's, a, it's an eyewitness account of Jesus' life. And there is, I, I'm quite aware that um, some of you here won't accept the Bible's authority. I, I, I'm not unaware of that, I understand that. Um, but I want us to have a look at this nonetheless. Partly it's, it, it, it prevents me from just sharing my thoughts about this topic. I, I, have, no, I have nothing to say, I have no answers. Um, it lets Jesus to be the one who defines uh, what Christianity is and isn't. So that's why we're going to have a look at it. And actually, if you're not persuaded, of the truth but um, I would say come back um, tomorrow we'll be thinking more about some of these things um, and it is as we look at these things and explore it we get a taste of whether it might be true um, so that's why we're going to have a look at it page um, 28 uh, John is a uh, friend of Jesus and um, one of his disciples and this is his eyewitness account uh, in there, we meet um, two of Jesus' friends, Mary and Martha, um, whose brother Lazarus is very ill. In fact, Lazarus uh, was one of Jesus' friends as well. If you look at sentence three, you'll see that. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is ill. And again in sentence five. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Lazarus was one of Jesus' friends. And I guess that means that um, Lazarus was someone that Jesus would have eaten with and confided in and shared struggles with and, and joked with. Someone he would have looked forward to catching up with. Someone whose presence would have just made him smile. Someone he would have missed when they were apart. They were friends. By the time that Jesus, Jesus arrives, Lazarus has died and has been buried. And this news really rocks Jesus. Have a look at verse uh, 33, sentence 33. It's on the next page. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. It's interesting, isn't it, how vividly we remember um, moments of, of grief when we've heard bad news. I remember uh, the day when I heard the news and it really sunk in for the first time that my uncle had died. I remember it to this day. I remember the day in the first year of university and when we got told the news that our friend up the corridor had died overnight. I remember the day sitting at our kitchen table when it really sunk in that my friend Jimmy, whom I played rugby with, had died of cancer. Well, just like us in those horrible moments, so here, Jesus is grieving with all the rawness and emotion that's involved with that. You see, Lazarus was Jesus' friend, and now he's dead. He hurts. So to zoom out of that for just a moment, the first thing I think we can say in answer to this question is that when it comes to our suffering, Jesus isn't some impersonal, cold, detached figure, someone who's blissfully naive or unaware of what's going on. No, he knows just what it's like to suffer because he's been there himself. He cares. He weeps with us on our pain. He shares our sense of outrage that this isn't the way it should be. He does care. But that does make us think, well, if he cares so much, but yet doesn't do anything about it, it must mean that he, he, he therefore can't. He's not powerful. He's not able to do anything about it. He mustn't be the one who claims to be all-powerful and divine. Now, 
that might be a conclusion that some of you will come to, but actually, that's an answer that doesn't fit the evidence either. And I think this is perhaps the, the hardest part of the answer to accept emotionally speaking. But what we see here is that Jesus is not powerless to help. Actually, at this point in John's Gospel, uh, we've seen Jesus demonstrate remarkable God-like power. In chapter 4, he meets a royal official whose son is at death's door. Jesus isn't even near the, the, the boy. And yet he says a word, and the boy makes a full recovery. In chapter 5, Jesus comes across a man barely able to walk because of some awful disability that he's suffered with for 38 years. Jesus says to him, go, get up, get up, pick up your mat and walk. And he does. In chapter 9, he comes across a man blind from birth whom he gives complete sight to. Remarkable incidents, incidences of, of Jesus' Uh, divine power healing people stopping all manner of suffering and illness so we mustn't let Jesus off the hook by saying oh he can't stop the suffering because again and again he shows that he can so this I hope you can see this this leaves us with a real conundrum still Jesus does care yeah, he is powerful to put an end to it just like that as he's shown and yet he doesn't why not? It was very confusing. And for Mary and Martha, these sisters, it causes them real confusion and sadness. They say, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. I can see that you care. I can see that you're powerful. So why didn't you stop it? Actually, the next thing I want us to see here um, is even more shocking. What we see here is that Jesus deliberately decides not to intervene in this circumstance. Going back to whenever um, Jesus is told the news um, that, his, that his friend Lazarus is ill, we're told in sentence 4 and 5 that he stayed where he was another two more days. Now that is perplexing. Why would you do that if you could do something about it and you care? Why doesn't he intervene? There's got to be a good reason, a very good reason we would say, for Jesus to refrain. A reason that must significantly outweigh the pain and the suffering. Well, I think the Bible gives us two reasons. First reason, though caring and powerful, Jesus doesn't stop the suffering. Firstly, because of his... I suppose respect for the law of cause and effect, for our real choice. You see, when we flick onto the news, we've got to conclude that a lot of the suffering is caused and down to us. I flicked onto the BBC News website just this morning. Um, it's the uh, uh, Holocaust Memorial Day. I read about um, a gross murder suspect um, who had faced charges previously of crime victims ignored and confused, of a, of a murder caused by a machete. We do get injured in the crossfire, but we can't deny that we are responsible for firing some of the bullets. And so for Jesus to stop the suffering, one of the things he'd have to do would be to stop us. So if I got a, a bit angry, uh, and I wanted to hit Ben, or, or Izzy, or whoever it was, for God to stop the suffering, he'd have to put a, a force field around them. Or he'd have to stop my, my fist f f from going any further. But that wouldn't make any sense. It, would, it, it, it wouldn't acknowledge our dignity as human beings. Uh, that would be diminished, would be like robots. Our actions would be devoid of significance if that were the case. Well, that's the first reason. I think the second reason that we, the Bible tells us why um, Jesus doesn't stop the suffering, partly is to, to, sometimes, is to wake us up to our need of rescue. And I think that is what's going on in this um, scenario here. And have a look uh, again at John 11, sentence 14 and 15. If you've closed, it's on page 30, page 29, 14 and 15. 
What do you make of this? So then he told them plainly, Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I was not there. So that you may believe. But let us go to them. That's quite a thing to say, isn't it? I'm glad I wasn't there. Now, we know he's not glad about the suffering. He's glad because the end result, in this case, is more people believing in him. Now, I don't know what you think about that. I think that could sound very, very callous. All of that suffering that could have been prevented just so that people would believe in Jesus. That's a hard pill to swallow. But here's the thing. According to Jesus, if that suffering leads people to believe in him, then in his economy, he says, it is worth it. Because our whole eternity hinges on whether we believe in Jesus or not. And Jesus cares so much about getting people to that belief that he's glad to give us evidence to help us believe. C.S. Lewis, I don't know if you've read any of his books, he was the author of the Chronicles of Narnia. He puts it like this. God whispers to, to us in our pleasures, speaks to us in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It's his megaphone to rise a deaf world. You might want to ask more questions about that at the end. One last thing. Whilst Jesus doesn't stop the suffering, although he does care and is powerful, he himself says that one day he will. He will one day put an end to all of the suffering. He promises a wonderful solution to our broken world. Now that is what Jesus says to Mary and Martha as they try to come to terms with this loss of their brother. Have a look at verse 25 and 26. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? What's going on here? These aren't just beautiful poetic words. This isn't Jesus saying, well, do you know what, Lazarus, he is a good chap, but we'll not forget him. We'll always remember him. No. These words represent a real, tangible hope in the face of suffering. Because what Jesus is talking about here is a whole new future world order for those who believe in him. A life after death, a world without suffering. Imagine it. Imagine a world without hospitals because no one ever gets sick. Imagine a world with no prisons because no one hurts anybody anymore. Imagine a place where life insurers and funeral directors go out of business because people don't die. Imagine a place where charities are disbanded because there's just no need for them because there are no needy people anymore. This is what's being on offered here. And Jesus shows that he's talking about this for real by miraculously raising Lazarus from the dead. It's as if he says, you know, I've said this thing, but it is true and I want to prove it to you. Sentence 43 and 44. Jesus called in a loud voice. Can you imagine it? Lazarus, come out. Verse 44. The dead man came out his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. One minute, this is the claim of John's Gospel, he is dead and buried, literally brain dead, decomposing. Four days he'd been in the tomb. Three words later, he is up, walking, talking, the scene is totally transformed communicating he says like I do really care about suffering and I am able to put a stop to it and you know what one day I will just as we finish um, I mentioned this lady Sharon at the, at the beginning of my talk um, listen to this is her daughter speaking this was in the in the pamphlet that was produced at her funeral this is her daughter's story speaking about her mum I can still remember her 
I can still remember hearing her talk about God and heaven, this new world, with such a light in her eyes, the enthusiasm and ex excitement evident in all she said, explaining to me that she wouldn't need her wheelchair anymore. In my innocence, I asked how we were going to get around if we didn't have it. She answered that her legs would work then, and that she wouldn't need it anymore. Heaven, when my mum spoke, seemed so near and so real, so irresistible, that I wanted to be with her too. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He, he who believes in me will, will live even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Well, that's, that's quite enough for me. We're going to have a, a pause, a chance to process what's being said, to scribble down some questions, and we're going to have a couple of us up on a panel. We're very happy to take questions on what's been said or any other questions surrounding this, this topic. So take a break for a couple of minutes. Are they ready? Yeah, they're ready. Yeah, hello there. Uh, isn't the root of all suffering because of the fall of man? Thanks. Thanks. Yes, that's very, very helpful. So, so this is something that, that I didn't talk about, but it's something else that the Bible talks. Yeah, so the Bible, the, the worldview that the Bible presents is a world that was made that was, was perfect, but that we, uh, we rebelled against our king, the creator, and actually the the way the Bible talks about it is that in response to that, as a punishment, God cursed the world and uh, the earth. So that would be a reason. Yes, why? That is the, the root of, of, of all suffering. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, okay, so uh, we'll go to you next. But after the text, so we have one that fits in quite well to that. Sure. So you're focused on Lazarus and individual suffering. What about natural disasters, earthquakes, typhoons, etc.? Are these allowed by God? And are they allowed so that God will, that others will turn to God? Um, yes, they are. The, the, I don't want to say this callously, but, but the, the, the Bible says yes, they, they, they are allowed by God. Um, coming back to what we were just saying about how God has cursed the world. Um, yes, they are allowed by God. We don't know the, the purpose of all suffering, um, but certainly these things that we've been saying about God's megaphone to rise the deaf world is true. We're, we are to learn the, the, the lesson of, of suffering, that uh, this world is broken. There is a promise of a better world, and we're to, we, are to, we are to believe in our King um, who made us. Yeah. So that won't be everything that needs to be said. Uh, so, sorry, I missed most of your talk. Um, but the thing is that um, I understood that the early Christians, uh, after Jesus Christ was crucified and rose up, the early Christians believed that he would come back at that time, fairly early. Now, he never did. And it's been 2,000 years he hasn't come back. Now, it seems a fairly long time uh, for him to not come back. You know what I mean? Uh, there, there have been, been predictions all over for the last 2,000 years. None of the predictions have been true. Just recently, um, uh, someone in America predicted it, and it was not true. So I, I just wonder, it, you know, this is something that um, you're thinking about the future. I just wonder whether it's actually true. Tim, you um, really helpful question, um, suggesting that the predictions of Jesus coming back are not true. Uh, Jesus himself said that no one knows when it's going to happen, and lots of people since then have said, I know when it's going to happen, and they've been proved wrong. So in that sense, I don't think we can say Jesus was wrong about that. Jesus said he's going to come back, and it's not right now. And lots of people have said, oh, I know when it's going to happen, it's going to happen on this day, and they've been proved wrong. And the Bible does talk about the fact that it's been a while, even within the time of Jesus following followers, people were saying very similar things, why isn't he back? And um, the, the response to that was um, partly, and um, God is, um, uh, counts time differently from us, so for, um, for him uh, it's described as being a thousand years is like a day, so it's actually been two days since Jesus has gone. The other thing that's slightly more, the other thing that's slightly more helpful I think in the light of today's talk is that the reason God has not sent Jesus back yet is because he is patient wanting everybody um, to repent. Um, in terms of the language we've been talking about today, he wants everybody to enjoy this perfect world that's coming. And there are lots of people who don't yet. 
and he is patient because he wants to give more people the opportunity. And um, it's a great question, we can talk more about that. I guess it's probably helpful to have particularly um, questions about today's talk and the issue of suffering if there's more. Okay, a uh, really interesting one here actually. Okay, with regards to suffering, do you think that, do you think that God is selfish? Thanks. Um, I can understand, I think, why someone in the face of suffering could come to that conclusion. I don't think that's right. I don't think God is selfish because of what we've seen in the light of today. You see that Jesus, um, uh, who is God, the Son of God, um, represents exactly what God is like. And you don't, I don't think we see a, a selfishness in him. He's doing everything for the sake of the other person, for the sake of Lazarus, for, for the sake of those, for, for his sisters, that they may believe and may enjoy um, his, his, his new creation and world with him. Um, yeah, I don't think I'd say more than that. I think another thing that's quite helpful is to suggest that God is selfish suggests that he is looking on at others' suffering and not personally engaged with it. But I think one of the really helpful things, if you look through the rest of that account that John's written, is to see Jesus himself suffering. Um, Jesus, God himself, experiencing suffering. I think to describe God as selfish imagines that he has never himself experienced suffering. suffering. Um, but if our, our account here is correct, then he has. And we've got a long, long description of it that you can read yourselves. Um, yeah, anyone got bits of paper? Or, yeah, go for it. Um, so does God intervene for some people? Um, if he does, does that make him unjust or unjust? Uh, again, actually, I was just trying to think of the most helpful answer um, off the bat. Again, if you turn um, in those books to lots of places in that account, you can see Jesus acting in specific cases. Um, so it is true that God um, can, and we can see in history, God has acted for specific people. I think that shows incredible kindness towards them. It doesn't promise that God acts in every case for every person, and that's been all of our experience, I imagine. Um, as Izzy mentioned, I'm a, um, my background's in medicine, I've worked in hospitals, and I've seen countless people experiencing extraordinary suffering. It's quite clear that God doesn't act in every case. It's also quite clear as we look um, uh, in these accounts, and many of us may have had experience of God acting in some cases. I don't think that makes him unjust. Um, I think it means that God has acted really kindly in some cases, and we can be really grateful when that does happen. Okay, so uh, um, earlier on, the fact our world is fallen was mentioned, um, and this comes about, and many, many Christians believe this happened because of Adam and Eve eating the forbidden fruit. Why should we be punished for Adam and Eve eating this fruit? I think because... Um, uh, I suppose Adam, Adam is the representative of humanity. He he did he didn't just eat a fruit, a, a piece of fruit. Um, we're told to eat fruit. Fruit is a good thing. You should eat some fruit. Um, um, what what Adam did wrong is really what any one of us would have done. We all would have done the same thing, and we prove that by the way that we live our lives. I know that's certainly true for myself. What Adam did was not just eating a piece of fruit. He, um, he pushed away the, the, the God who made him, the rightful king of the world, um, who, who owned him, who made the rules, and said, no, I want to be the, the king myself. That, that's high treason against uh, the most important person in the entire universe. That's, that's why it's so serious, rather than just eating a fruit. So it's worth, worth saying that. And I've forgotten the, the first part of the question. Why should we punish be punished because of Adam? Because by our lives, we show that we, we, may, we do the same thing as Adam did every day in pushing God away. Um, yeah. I think it's, it's maybe helpful to that that whole account in at the beginning of the Bible is is quite I, don't, I think it's quite kind of dense it's quite nuanced it's quite subtle there's an awful lot going on there but there's a sense in which when man 
turns away from God. God, I suppose, sees what that is, what the implications of that are going to be, and He says that is not the world as I meant it to be. That is not the world that I wanted, and not the world I've created. And I won't allow the rebellion of me in the way that you're going to fill the world with violence and suffering to be the final word here. And so He says at that point, no. And to my mind, that's what is going on with the curse in Genesis 3. He's saying, no, that way of life is not forever viable. And I'm going to do something different here. And by pronouncing that curse, I'm going to ensure that there will be an end to evil and suffering. Uh, any more? Any more for any more? No? Okay. Ah, yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. <coughs> Um, I perhaps understand why there is suffering, but why so much suffering? Like, there just seems to be so much vast quantities of it in all forms. I think it's a really helpful observation. I think lots of people talk about this world as though it's getting better and better. I think actually when we look around at the world, we see more and more suffering, um, partly because we're more informed than we used to be. Um, I think it's... It's a helpful wake-up call to a generation that says there's no God. And if, if it is God's loudspeaker, it's a, it's a helpful loudspeaker for us to hear. I'm not saying that is the reason that all the suffering in the world is happening. Um, I think it's very hard to quantify the difference in suffering. There are wonderful ways, aren't there? I guess some people here studying ways in which we have um, got better health care than we used to, less suffering in terms, um, um, all sorts of terms in that sense, but also other kinds of suffering that, that, that does still exist. Um, so I guess... Why do we see more suffering? Perhaps because we're better informed. Why is there so much suffering? Because a loudspeaker, in part, perhaps because a loudspeaker is needed to waken us all up. Um, yeah. It's quite a... It's, I think it's a difficult thing for us because there is... I don't know if anywhere there is any definitive why answer. I'm not sure if within any particular worldview, or, or maybe you could you could challenge that and say, well, there is, are there some, but are they satisfying? Um, and actually what Christians can be in danger of doing is in trying to provide some answers, they start to sound as if they're giving definitive answers. I think that's kind of what Tim was saying there, is that you just want to... I think all Christians would want to step back from saying, we're not ever going to give you a, a, an entirely definitive answer as to why some suffering is happening here and some is happening there, even as to why there's so much. Um, but actually, there's, it's, it's maybe worth saying in the midst of that, with what you see in Jesus of a God stepping into suffering and experiencing suffering from, for himself, that somehow he is present in it and not removed from it and not distant and I think you begin from that to start to have um, the resources, the means to face suffering in the world um, Could you argue that God, if he's in control of everything, causes our suffering? I think what we've seen in, in John's Gospel is that, yes, God is in control of everything. Um, does God cause our suffering? Um, well, we, what we do, we've seen from, from Genesis 3 and the fall, yes, God, God does. God, God, God actively curses the world in response to our rebellion against him. Um, I don't know what else I'm going to say. Um, I think at the heart of that question is partly why and who God God actually is in his being that makes a difference. I think if we start to think of God a bit like Santa Claus, then that question is going to be really difficult to answer. If we think of God as a God who just gives us what we want, a bit like writing a, a list to Santa, then we're going to start to fall into a trap of thinking, okay, how can you know how can God be in control and 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 do these things. But if we start to think of God as somebody different, somebody who's with us in the in the hurting, in the suffering, as Phil's been talking about today, I think I think that flips the whole question. And um, if we have a an understanding of God as somebody who is there and with us and sees us, then the question is, you know, it's, it's far more uh, easy to to think through. Because it's not a it's not a God who is desiring and wanting um, particular things from us. Yep. Okay.
okay anymore? Yeah. Oh, is it all right if we, oh, yeah. just because, you know, can't have a second yet. <laughs> Hi there. My question is, um, did God not give the control, the uh, power and authority to man, to mankind? Um, and if so, would that not suggest that some of the control is actually in, within us uh, through the uh, power of the Holy Spirit? I think Phil really helpfully talked about that a little bit in his talk. Um, I don't know if you were able to, to catch that bit earlier on when he said um, that uh, there is a respect for cause and effect and real choices. So if Phil decided to get angry with us on the panel because we hadn't really respected him enough in his talk, <laughs> and he beat us all up, um, part of the way that God respects that real choice would be for him to have effectively beaten him up. I'm pretty sure he could take me out. Um, and it is, uh, we make real choices for which we are responsible, and that is a true thing. But the Bible also says that, that God is in control of everything. He stands behind everything. And part of the reason um, I say that is just because I want us to be clear on what the Bible does say about that. Um, as Phil said again at the beginning of his talk, um, these aren't our ideas that we're randomly coming up with because we think they sound interesting. The Bible speaks of a God who really is in control. Now, there's lots of points that we, of that which I don't completely understand and are difficult. But actually, in, on the question of suffering, I think it's wonderful to know there is a God who is in control, that he hasn't got his hands tied, prevented from having any impact, that he is forced out of my life, and, um, and uh, that I've somehow managed to beat him out. Actually, God is really there. He really is in control. But as we've seen, he also um, respects real choices that we make. And so there is a cause and effect. If Phil throws a punch, I will get a black eye. <laughs> As Christians, how do you cope with suffering? And similarly, um, how has being a Christian helped you cope with suffering in a real world example? Yeah. Um, I think being a Christian um, changes the way that you perceive suffering in a really profound way. So it's not that I would rely on God as a, as a crutch because I, I need God in that situation, but I'd see it more as because God is real and because I know and trust that he is good, then I'm able to, um, to get through a situation in a completely different way. I think if I wasn't a Christian, I would really struggle um, with, with facing suffering because I would have nowhere to, to turn to. I'd have no one who was with me in, in my suffering nobody who could experience in the same way that I can. I think there's something really beautiful in um, people journeying together in suffering. So um, when I was younger, my mum had pneumonia and she got it twice in the same year and it was life-threatening. And it was really hard and it was a really difficult time, but she you know, came through it and she's you know, absolutely fine now. Um, but then this year, one of my friends, his, um, his dad got pneumonia and he was really ill. And I was able to, to be there and to say to him, look, this is, this is awful, but I know what you're going through. I know it hurts and I know it's really hard, but actually God is good and he is there. So I think in some ways it's, it's something a little bit like that. It's God saying, I'm there, I'm with you. That feeling of empathy, that feeling that when somebody connects, when somebody says, okay, I know, I know that it hurts, I know it's painful. I think that's what God says to us. He says, I know it hurts, I know it's painful, but I'm there. And that's what I feel when I go through difficult situations. I can read God's word and I can see the message of hope and I can see, yeah, it's really, it's really rubbish. But there's somebody that's there, there's somebody that has that empathy, who understands me and understands what I'm going through. It's, um, it's also maybe worth adding that uh, it, I guess it's kind of been slightly slightly dismissed in, in way, the way people talk about um, a sort of pie in the sky when you die type thing, that there's this, this sort of anesthetizing of, uh, of pain in the Christian worldview because you say, oh, it's right, it'll all be okay in the future at some point. Um, I don't think that's an adequate assessment of what Christianity has to say about future hope as an aside, but I want to kind of defend that position that Christians have where they say actually we are looking forward because there is something incredibly powerful about facing suffering with hope it's it's not the kind of 
I think this is this is just very important to say that it's not a, a thin, a kind of um, oh, just it'll all be fine sort of hope. Just grin and bear it for now. But there's something very heavy and solid and weighty about a future reality that is as real, if not more real, than this one. A one where the promises are of, of this kind of shape, where sorrow is swallowed up in joy, and, and is somehow greater for the suffering that has gone before. Now, that, don't, again, don't mishear me to be justifying present suffering by saying that. I, I don't think that's what... Um, I think that would be the wrong thing to understand from that. But there is this um, robustness to Christian hope that says actually that there will be something so full and so glorious in the way that everything is put right that it will make that all okay. That will things everything will come uh, will come good. Okay, um, I do apologise if you've got any burning questions, but given that it's five two and some of you may have lectures or places to be, we we'll end it. The sound as well. Uh, we're going to end it there. So, yeah, um, there's loads of foods at the back. Please feel free to take whatever you want. Um, just a quick plug. We have events at uh, same place, same time, ooh, every day this week. Um, so before you run off, there's Sarah. Sarah, give us a wave at the back. Um, is going to be handing out flyers for tomorrow's event, which is all about who really was the historical Jesus. Um, it's going to be really great. Um, so feel free to come. And... Yeah, feedback forms are in the little pink gloss bottles that you had, so please fill them in. If you're interested in meeting up with um, a Christian UCL student, then we can sort that out for you. If so, we need your contact details, obviously. If not, then just give us a rating out of five or whatever. Um, just helps us to... Yeah. So, uh, yeah, if you give those once, you filled them in to Sarah, who's at the back. Um, and feel free to stick around. We've got the room till three, so we can carry on asking questions, chatting... Um, and we have a book that you can take away which Ben wrote and it's really great I've read it um, it's just kind of a sweeping overview of the evidence for the existence of God um, so a good starting place if you're genuinely intrigued but want to know for yourself that it's robust and reliable um, yeah thank you so much for coming we're really pleased that you did and take away the gospel so take a book take a gospel take a flyer take a feedback form fill it in give it back and yeah take some food